Good day. I am uh, Bien uh, Ganapin from the Trade Services and Industry staff of NEDA. Today, I will be discussing expanding economic opportunities in industry and services through Trabajo at Negocio from Chapter 9 of the Midterm Update of the Philippine Development Plan 2017 to 2022. I will be breaking down Chapter 9 by presenting the following subchapters. First, uh, Chapter 9A expanding economic opportunities in industry, 9B, expanding economic opportunities in services, and 9C, expanding access to economic opportunities in industry and services for investments, startups, MSMEs, and cooperatives. Allow me to begin by sharing the sectoral assessment. Then the challenges, strategic thrusts, followed by the discussion on the updated strategic frameworks, and plan targets. We have also listed the proposed legislative agenda to address the issues identified under the industry and services sectors. We'll go first to the industry sector. Now, the industry sector's contribution to, uh, to overall growth remains within its 10-year average, with sustainability strengthened by the establishment of regional inclusive innovation centers, or RIICs, in four pilot areas. Cebu, Davao, Cagayan de Oro, and Bicol. Now, these centers, which are under the country's what we call IQS strategy, are used to promote the adoption of appropriate technologies in existing industry clusters. These include the areas of supply chain, value adding and agro processing, access to technologies, financing, regulation, and certification for high-value crops such as rubber, mangoes, coffee, cacao, and coconut, and also especially provide another channel for MSMEs to enhance their goods and services. However, with the COVID-19 global health crisis, the country's vulnerabilities in the industry sector were spotlighted, and this compelled the government to play a larger role in implementing appropriate stimuli to revive consumer and business confidence. In addition to this, we are also facing a number of challenges, specifically with lower domestic demand. We saw recent decline in industry, which was worsened by supply chain disruptions, existing policies limiting foreign participation in critical support services sectors, and the high innovation cost, among others. Specifically in the manufacturing sector, there is high innovation cost because of expensive technological licenses and also the lack of capable and innovative human resource who are capable of applying industry 4.0 technologies. To share with you our strategic thrusts for the sector, we have first the four RIICs, which I mentioned earlier, need to be closely monitored for possible scale up and replication in other areas. Second, the government needs to continue to push for the passage of critical reforms to liberalize key economic sectors, strengthen critical infrastructures such as ICT, logistics, transportation and utilities, and ensure that we address any gaps in the supply chain. Lastly, we also need to leverage the adoption of Industry 4.0 technologies to address high innovation costs and prioritize adoption of digitalization to usher the growth of the digital economy. In relation to this, the government is fast-tracking investments in human resource through the development of the National Digital Skills Framework. In terms of the updates in the strategic framework, all relevant strategies were retained as in the original PDP. Major change include surfacing across the regions and the digital economy lens. Also, market production expanded and production capacities increased, replaced market access improved, given that the latter is cross-referenced to chapter 15, which is about having a sound macroeconomic policy in both the original PDP and the midterm update. So this marks the concentration of strategies to improve supply side condition. On the updated plan target, uh, this table shows the core outcome level indicators under chapter 9A with their respective plan targets as of November 2020 PDP results matrices. Amid the COVID-19 pandemic and the disruption to consumer and businesses, the country's overall GDP and industry growth 
growth contracted sharply at 9.6% and 13.2% respectively. So the targets were also adjusted downwards to reflect this reality. 2021 to 2022, or end of plan targets, were revised to 6.5 to 7.5% for 2021 to 2022, which is consistent with the July 2020 DBCC revised GDP estimate. We are targeting 9.8 to 10.8% uh, gross value added in industry for 2021. And we expect that to normalize at 6.3 to 7.3% in 2022. Manufacturing GVA or the gross value added as a proportion of GDP target in 2021 is 16.6 to 16.7% and is targeted to reach 6.18 to 17% in 2022. Meanwhile, employment creation industry is targeted to be in the range of 400,000 to 500,000 in 2021 and is expected to moderate to around 200,000 in 2022. The higher growth and employment projection in industry and manufacturing in 2021 is presumed or attributed to a low base effect um, given 2020's uh, negative growth performance. Still on the updated plan targets for the manufacturing employment as a proportion to total employment, it is targeted to reach 8% to 8.6% in 2021 and to 83 to 8.6% by the end of the planned period or from 2021 to 2022. Meanwhile, the target for the country's overall ranking in the World Bank's doing business report is retained. And to be able to achieve this, there is a need for a whole of government commitment to push through and deliver amid the unusual environment and tough competition with other countries to attract investment as well as retain and even expand existing businesses. For the consumer awareness indicator, the 2021 to 2022 targets were revised downward because of the operational constraints faced by the DTI Consumer Protection and Advocacy Bureau in carrying out consumer advocacy efforts. In terms of the legislative agenda, only the National Quality Infrastructure Law or the NQI law and the amendment to the Consumer Act were from the original PDP. The rest are new legislative priorities for the industry sector to adjusted to complement the recent developments in uh, caused by the, the pandemic. So let me go through this legislative agenda quickly. The amendment of the Foreign Investment Act. This aims to lift uh, certain restrictions in foreign investment to encourage FDI inflows by reducing employment threshold from 50 to 15 employees who are willing to set up shop in the country with a minimum paid in capital of at least 100,000 US dollars. Second, the Philippine e-vehicle industry. Uh, this bill aims to promote, encourage, and support e-vehicle production and usage towards adapting an eco-friendly and economical transportation landscape. So this will include providing time-bound and performance-based incentives for the manufacture, assembly, conversion, and sale of hybrid and other fuel alternative vehicles with charging stations in accordance with the CREATE law. The National Quality Infrastructure Law uh, aims to integrate and coordinate standardization, metrology, testing analysis, quality management, certification, and accreditation of goods produced in the country. So this could be at par with global standards. The national digital transformation, on the other hand, will require enhancing the foundation of the digital economy through greater in investments in ICT infrastructure and connectivity and setting up a sound regulatory environment that promotes digital adoption. The amendment to the contractor's license law will provide a level playing field and expand opportunities to eligible and qualified domestic and foreign contractors to encourage entry of new players in the construction sector. This will facilitate potential investments in quality and climate resilient infrastructure. Lastly, the amendment of the Consumer Act aims to update the current law in place to address consumer concerns and align existing business and industry practices at par with international standards and best practices and to cover the use of technology applications such as e-commerce. Moving on to the services sector, the Philippines being a consumer-driven economy, our assessment is that the services sector is an integral backbone of the economy. The services sector is the main growth driver of the economy, the top contributor to GDP, and the biggest employer 
during the first half of the planned period. However, the disruption of many services activities such as transport, tourism, restaurants and accommodation, recreation and, and other business services, uh, as we try to contain the spread of COVID-19, dragged the country's GDP growth to its lowest in decades. Two of the main challenges the services sector face are, first, the restrictive policy environment, that is foreign equity limitations, and second, the structural bottlenecks, that is weak backward linkages due to lack of necessary infrastructures. These two continue to hinder the potential for growth of the services sector. Moreover, the lingering effect of the pandemic poses a big challenge for the services sector in the near term. Demand for tourism and travel will, be, will still be generally low until such time that the COVID-19 is effectively contained. Furthermore, there is a need to prioritize the readiness of the country's digital infrastructure and stability of broadband connectivity as to help address the increasing demand for online transactions and alternative work arrangements. Moving forward, the assessment of current regulations need to be continued. Also needed are the continuous implementation and passage of necessary reforms to attract investments, which will push relevant services sectors to innovate and become globally competitive. With the new normal, we need to support the shift to digital-based services to facilitate the recovery of the services sector. The current slide shows the updated strategic framework for services, which has basically retained strategies from the initial framework but with the addition of the strategy on accelerating the recovery of the tourism and travel industry under the subsector outcome, competitiveness, innovativeness, and resilience increased. For the remaining plan period, the gross value added in services or GVA in services growth rate targets were adjusted based on the new assumptions and given current conditions. The GVA growth rate in the services sector is projected to expand by 5.8 to 6.8 percent and 7.3 to 8.3 percent in 2021 and 2022 respectively. Revision of target employment generation in services for 2021 and 2022 is consistent with the revision of target total employment generation, as you will note in Chapter 4, and revision of labor productivity in services you can see in chapter 10, in the same period, the sector is targeted to create an average net employment of 4.1 to 4.5 million at the end of the planned period by 2022. There were no changes in the targets for tourism GVA as a proportion of GDP and tourism employment as a proportion to total employment indicators. Likewise, there were no changes in the targets for number of inbound visitors and tourism inbound revenue for tourism indicators. Retained legislative agenda under the services sector are amendments to the Public Service Act, the Retail Trade Act, and the Foreign Investment Act, as well as the Open Access in Data Transmission Act. Here is the list of this legislative agenda, and let me go through them one by one quickly. First, Public Service Act. The most important proposed amendment of the Act is on the definition of a public utility, limiting the scope of public utility to electricity distribution and transmission, water pipeline distribution system, or sewerage pipeline system. This is to enable higher foreign equity participation in other key services areas, such as telecommunication and transportation services. Other notable amendments are on the applicable penalties and fines, introduction of rate setting methodologies, a review mechanism on FDAs, with national security implications and a comprehensive baseline survey on regulatory governance. On the Retail Trade Act, proposed amendments to the law are the relaxation of barriers to foreign investments in the retail sector by lowering the minimum paid up capital from 2.5 million US dollars and removing the paid up capital per store for enterprises engaged in high end or luxury products, among others. For the Foreign Investment Act, the proposed amendments include the reduction of the minimum employment requirement from 50 to 15 direct local hires. 
For the Open Access in Data Transmission Act, the bill aims to level the playing field in data transmission and telecommunications market. It is expected to strengthen the value chain linkages in the industry and services sectors and facilitate the realization of the full potential of e-commerce and digital trade. For the e-commerce act of 2000, this law will be revisited to accommodate e-commerce transactions, specifying the rights of consumers, strengthening the imposition of penalties on service providers, and require provision of security measures to ensure safety from possible breaches on data processing and money handling. Internet Transactions Act, on the other hand, defines the scope and coverage of internet transactions apart from the sale or exchange of digital products and lays down the code of conduct and qualifications for businesses who wish to engage in e-commerce. It also proposes for a creation of an e-commerce bureau under the DTI to handle complaints on internet transactions. The National Digital Careers Act of 2020 seeks to establish a legal framework for the gig economy that will map out strategies to promote and strengthen digital careers, as well as provide the needed institutional support. This is in recognition of emerging forms of employment, such as work on digital platforms. And lastly, the Fair and Transparent Destination and Other Shipping Charges Act, which mandates Marina to promote standardized destination and shipping charges among freight forwarders and agents of international shipping lines operating in the Philippines. This will also mandate the DTI, the PCC, the BOC, the BIR, and other relevant agencies to assist Marina in facilitating competition commerce, and an honest revenue system. Lastly, under the industry and services, we are also zooming in on strategies to expand opportunities for investment, startups, MSMEs, and cooperatives. To spur the development of startups, MSMEs, and cooperatives, a legal framework has been recently established, such as the following. Personal Property Security Act of 2018. This is the law which were in small businesses, particularly MSMEs, farmers, and fisher folks are provided uh, increased credit access by allowing the use of non-traditional collateral and movable assets as collateral. The Amendment Cooperative Development Authority Charter, this reorganizes and strengthens the CDA functions to include technical support and assist co-ops to have access to, to finance. Revised Corporation Code of the Philippines Act, this eliminate barriers to entry of both small and large enterprises by permitting the formation of one-person corporation and by allowing stockholders or members to exercise their rights through remote communication and in absentia voting, among others. And finally, the Philippine Innovative Startup Act of 2019 has established the Philippine Startup Development Program to provide assistance to startups and strengthen their startup ecosystem. Prior to the pandemic, the challenges among startups, MSMEs, and cooperatives include difficulty in accessing finance due to lack of collateral and inability to comply with loan requirements. And this further made it difficult by the lack of credit risk database. More so, Seed funds and grants available to support startup remain scarce. Foreign participation is likewise restricted, which limits uh, competition and investment flow. During the pandemic, however, demand for credit has stalled because of low business sentiment and weak consumer demand. The development of a credit risk database currently on the pipeline activities of the Banco Central ng Pilipinas, as well as a review of the current regulatory framework are needed to induce the expansion of startups and MSMEs. There is also a need to review foreign equity restrictions in critical sectors. While business continuity plans or BCPs and capacity building should be undertaken to overcome and prepare businesses and enterprises to potential risks. All relevant strategies in the original PDP were retained with some additions focusing on laying down a healthy and resilient Philippines, the medium-term strategies will leverage the digital economy and put in place anti-fragility measures for startups, MSMEs, and cooperatives across regions. This will address the constraints of operating under the new normal to attract further investments and increase resilience as well as revive business confidence. The following are the core outcome level indicators under Chapter 9C with their respective plan targets 
as of November 2020 PDP results matrices. Considering the DBCC revised growth forecast or revised growth targets, which reflected this very challenging period, the Board of Investments, the Philippine Statistics Authority, and the members of the Philippine Investment Promotion Plan or IPP steering committee approved the downward revised target of 7% annual increase in total IPA approved investments from the original 10% for 2021 to 2022. Note that for net FDI, while there were no targets agreed upon for this indicator by the Subcommittee on Industry and Services, the consensus of the joint subcommittee is to continue to monitor FDI inflows in the country to check if there is any progress made or there is significant increase over time from the baseline figures in 2016. This is consistent with the projected increase in total pledge investment as reported by the PSA. For the legislative agenda in relation to our MSMEs, co-ops, and startups, only the amendment of the Magna Carta for MSMEs was from the original PDP. The rest are new legislative priorities for the cross-cutting sector under industry and services. Proposed establishment of an enterprise rehabilitation fund is one of the suggested revisions on the proposed amendment of the Magna Carta of MSMEs and is suggested as part of small business corporations capitalization to be funded by the national government. The guide bill aims to provide financial assistance to firms that are strategically important to economic recovery, especially in their role in providing employment and supporting the Philippine economy. The P3 program of the SB Corp as a critical intervention during the pandemic will be institutionalized with the passage of the guide bill. This is intended to develop entrepreneurship and contribute to inclusive economic growth as well as provide accessible and reasonably priced financing to micro entrepreneurs as a viable alternative to usurious rates or high interest rates such as 5-6 loans. Lastly, the TIMTA amendment aims to mandate various registered business entities and investment promotion agencies to submit to NEDA relevant information needed to conduct economic cost benefit analysis or CBA and have the flexibility to refine the scope of data requirement and data tools to adequately capture information relevant to the conduct of this cost benefit analysis. And uh, that is all I want to share with you today on the plans and strategies for the industry and services sector through trabajo at negocio. And of course, expanding economic opportunities for our MSMEs, startups and cooperatives, among others, as we thread through uh, the recovery. This ends my presentation and uh, thank you very much.